I was booking lots of punk shows, having a grand old time um, in the South because it was like really community based. Like all the all the fun punk music that was happening at this time in Arkansas, it, it was more often not at like venues and bars and stuff like that. And more frequently was at just like our rundown houses and mm-hmm. bands would play in our living room and stuff like that. Mm-hmm. Like um, the way like punk was supposed to be played. How punk is meant to be. Yes. That's how punk is supposed to be. Yes. <laughs> um, and um, also there was a lot of younger people in the community, like teenage girls and stuff like that, which I think is really cool because mm-hmm. I think it's it's cool for younger kids to have um, an opportunity to have access to – music and see that you can do it yourself you Mm -hmm. know like a real DIY or die mindset from Mm -hmm. a young age which I appreciate but uh, the unfortunate part of that was that because there was adults and like young people in the same community like some of these young kids were like getting exposed to drugs at a younger age Um, and so me and my friends decided we wanted to start an overdose prevention project um, to make sure that you know these young people had access to Narcan Um, and so we did like a fundraiser show and raised like a small amount of money. I think it was like $700 that we Mm -hmm. initially raised. And then we just stockpiled a bunch of Narcan and started giving it out to people. Um, and it kind of gained more traction and attention than we thought it would. And, you know, I was just putting my personal phone number out there for anybody who wanted it. I was like, text me, come over to my house, and I'll give you Narcan, like, to anybody. Mm-hmm. Um, we should probably tell people who don't know what Narcan is. Oh, okay. So Narcan is an overdose prevention drug. Um, it can stop an opioid overdose. Like, if somebody is overdosing on heroin or, like, oxys or roxies or, I mean, opium, that probably wouldn't happen. But, mm-hmm. um, yeah, any opioid drugs, whether it's press pills and also fentanyl. Yeah, Most which is relevantly. a huge problem these days. Mm-hmm. Um, which has massively contaminated the drug supply chain in the U.S. Um, yeah, so if you're overdosing on any of those things, only on opioids, not on, like, meth or right. stimulants or something right. like that, um, then you can administer – well, you wouldn't if you're overdosing, but somebody who's with you could right. administer the Narcan to you and stop the overdose. Like, it, the naloxone hydrochloride um, – like compounds will literally knock the opioid compounds off the opioid receptors mm-hmm. and temporarily hold that space. Right. So, um, which is pretty cool. Yeah. That you can just do that at home. Like you don't yeah. need a doctor to stop an overdose. Yeah. Anybody can do it. Yeah. Um, and it requires like only like a five minute training to learn how to do it. Mm-hmm. So um, I would give – I would give out lots of Narcan and teach people how to use it on the spot, and then they would hand it out to their friends, and they would hand it out to their friends, and everything spread really quickly by word of mouth. Mm-hmm. Um, and suddenly there was a big demand in the community because this was the only source of free Narcan in the state of Arkansas right. at this time. Um, and so I didn't know that I was starting something so impactful at the time, but there was suddenly a really huge demand because we were in like a complete vacuum of services Mm -hmm. um and anybody who was at risk for overdose wanted some because the even like the pharmacy access laws in Arkansas at that time were a little bit weird like you couldn't even necessarily access Narcan at a pharmacy for sure um which is crazy now like thinking about it from the perspective of what it's like here in California which has been a harm reduction hub since since the HIV crisis yeah. um, started. Um, yeah, I had to pick up painkillers the other day, mm-hmm. and um, they had to offer me Narcan. Like, yeah. by law, the pharmacy did. As they should. Yeah. <laughs> As they should. Yeah. Um, but, yeah, so the overdose prevention project that um, I was working on kind of just took off, and I got connected to mentors and like, the larger harm reduction space, and if you don't know, harm reduction is like a a perspective on how people who are engaging in like risky but mm-hmm. risky behaviors or whatever, whether that be um, stuff in, that has to do with sex work or drug use or anything like that, it's ways that they can reduce the amount of danger. Yeah, as opposed to like completely eliminating it. Yeah, it's, yeah. it's like sex education in school is like yeah. another harm reduction tactic that more people are familiar with. Right. Um. But 
yeah, I got connected to some mentors and they essentially gave me the opportunity to make my project really big and get a contract with Pfizer Pharmaceutical. Um, and I took the opportunity, but in order to fully dive into that, I needed to find another job that was going to pay me because the project that I was starting was not like a paid opportunity. Like mm -hmm. we had enough money to get Narcan for people, but we didn't have enough money to pay a full-time worker all year round right and so i basically was like i'll do this for free but i need another job and i was serve i was waiting tables at the yeah. time was my like money making job um and so i started stripping <laughs> because it's really flexible i yeah. could strip at night and then do my like business stuff during the day and and people could like pick up narcan from me and like a really flexible schedule i could drop it off to them and stuff like that. I would mostly deliver. Like we started like a hotline system. Um. <laughs> Damn, girl. We're like 12 minutes in and I'm so impressed by you. You like started stripping to save lives. Oh my gosh. I mean, seriously. Yeah. Basically, <laughs> we just dived in like the most serious part of my life immediately in the interview. Um, <laughs> but yeah, so I started doing that. And then when COVID started, I, th I think I was like a year and a half or two years into stripping by that time. Mm -hmm. You know, my, my project was a little bit more established. We had like a small team of volunteers running mm -hmm. everything. And we had just gotten like a drop in space mm -hmm. that people could like stop by our office and stuff like that. Eventually mm -hmm. I got to the point where I was like, okay, it's not really reasonable every anymore for everybody to know my home address. Mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> um, nothing bad ever happened. I just was like, it's probably not that smart. Yeah. yeah. Um, but yeah, so, and once COVID shut down, uh, like, all the clubs that we were working in, um, our the project had been a little bit more established, and so I started doing OnlyFans, mm -hmm. and so I had even more flexibility to sink more time into the project, and then I was eventually lucky enough to be able to help it kind of get on its own feet and me move somewhere else. Hey, guys. If you want to support my show, then you should think about joining my Patreon. At my Patreon, I offer all kinds of amazing perks in exchange for your financial support. From live streams of my interviews as they are happening, to bonus Q&As, behind the scenes photos and videos of my shoots, plus cool merch like stickers, mugs, and hoodies, we have you covered. So go to patreon.com slash hollyrandallunfiltered, and while you're at it, make sure that you click that subscribe button so you don't miss a single one of my new updates.